Part 1 There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. And you will hear a conversation between two people talking about insecticide. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Yes? Oh, good morning, madam. I'm from Pest Away Market Research. I'm doing consumer research in this area. I wonder if you'd mind telling me, do you use Pest Away in your home? Pest Away? Oh, the insecticide thing. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Well, what do you use it for, madam? Fleas, ants, cockroaches, woodworm? Oh, cockroaches. This is an old house, you see, and we often get cockroaches in the kitchen. I tried scrubbing and disinfecting, but it didn't seem to do much good. And then I heard a commercial about Pest Away, so I thought I'd try that. Was that on TV? No, it was radio, one of those early morning shows. You heard it advertised on the radio? Fine. And you say you use it in the kitchen. Do you use it anywhere else in the house? In the bathroom, say? Oh, no. We've never had any trouble anywhere else. We get the odd wasp in the summer sometimes, but I don't bother about them. It's the cockroaches I don't like. Nasty, creepy, crawly things. And you find Pest Away does the trick? Well, yes. It's quite good. It gets rid of most of them. How long have you been using it, madam? Oh, let's see. About two years now, I think. About two years. And how often do you find you have to spray? Oh, I give the kitchen a good spray round the skirtings and under the stove, you know, about every six weeks. Every six weeks or so, I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. About every six weeks. Every six weeks or so, I see. Uh, where do you buy your pest away, madam? A supermarket? Chemist? Oh, no. I get it at the little shop at the end of this street. They stock practically everything. It means taking a bus if I want to go to the supermarket. Well, thank you very much, madam. Oh, could I have your name, please? Mrs. Edgerton. Mary Edgerton. That's E-G-E-R-T-O-N. E-G-E-R-T-O-N. And the address? The address is 12 Holly, Peterford. 12 Peterford. And may I ask your age, madam? Oh, well, just put down I'm over 50. As you like, Mrs. Egerton. And occupation? Housewife? Well, I used to be a telephonist before I married. I had a very good job at the post office, but what with a husband to look after and four children to bring up, it doesn't leave you much time, does it? Occupation, housewife. Well, thank you very much for your time, madam. You've been most helpful. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two first year engineering students discussing their project on devices which have been specially designed for use in developing countries. First, Look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and decide which four planned developments are mentioned. Hi Aileen, thanks for coming. No problem. We've got our presentation coming up on Tuesday, so we need to get everything prepared now. Yeah, so we're agreed that we're going to concentrate on these two devices which have particularly helped people in developing countries. Yes. And we'll present the information in the form of a table, so it'll be really clear for non-specialists. We'll have three columns, you know, using the headings we discussed in the last seminar. OK, I've got those here. I'll make notes. So, let's start with the clockwork radio and how it works. We'll obviously say how it's powered, i.e. that it's wound up. Yeah, and we'll also need to explain how the energy is stored. OK. In a spring. Fine. Keep it simple. But we also need to say that the thing which makes the mechanism so special is the inclusion of a gearbox, you know, which makes it possible to release energy extremely slowly. Mm. And that means that it can operate for a long time with minimal effort. OK. Now, the next section is what are its benefits? I suppose we just need to emphasise that it costs a lot less than radios which use batteries. And if we want to, we can explain that these can cost as much as a week's wages in some parts of the world. Absolutely. And related to that, of course, is the fact that people don't have to depend on buying anything in a store, which in remote rural areas is really important. Mm. And then in the developments column, I think the most important thing we need to say is that the combination of the wind-up mechanism with a solar cell means that during the day it runs on the sun's energy and you only have to wind it up when it's dark, which makes it a much more attractive option. And that's probably that for the radio. Yep. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. So we'll then move on to the solar box cooker. And again, let's keep the description of the mechanism very simple. We need to say that it uses sunlight rather than conventional fuels to cook food. But we also need to explain two elements of why it's so efficient. Yeah. The fact that sun's rays enter through a plastic cover. Mm, better call it a lid. I thought it was made of glass. Mm, not according to my research. Mm, OK. And then we just say that light is transformed into heat and... Because it has a longer wavelength means that it gets trapped. And so it cooks the food. Good. Right. And then where do we begin on the advantages? <laughs> There's so many. I suppose we have to begin with the fact that you no longer need to cut down trees, which brings a whole raft of other benefits in its turn. Mm, sure. And related to that, I think we need to say that because dung is no longer needed as a fuel for cooking, it can be used as a fertiliser. Which leads to better harvests. And then there's the fact that there is absolutely no smoke. 
I was reading somewhere that there's a huge incidence of lung complaints, especially among women and children who have to breathe in smoke from conventional cookers. So that's another plus point. Yep. And then we need to say something about the way cookboxes have been improved. I think we can emphasise the fact that a reflector is often added at an angle to the lid to maximise the amount of light entering. Yes, good point. And also, I read about the fact that the floor or base of the box is raised, which improves heat retention. Oh, and I think we should mention the fact that many of the new boxes have a sloping or inclined lid, which increases the surface area to capture the sun's rays. Yes, that's a good point to finish on. I think. So I'll write up that table on an OHT if you like, and we're all set for our presentation. Yes, great. If there's anything else that you think we should discuss. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a group of students, Henry, Joe, Nancy, and Gordon, discussing changes to their work experience placement arrangements. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Look, there's the notice that Professor Jones told us he'd be putting up, confirming the details of our work experience placements. But I thought that was already arranged. No, he said he'd have to check with the companies that the days we preferred were okay for them. Let's see if any have changed. Teresa's not here today, but her name's first. It says the Uni Bookshop, Friday mornings, starting on the twenty-third of March. So nothing's changed. I'll let her know. What about Manuel? He's not here either. Is he still going to the music store in the High Street? If it's mainly music. Yes, he's still down for that on Friday afternoons, starting on the ninth. Um, the day's different. It's changed from Tuesday mornings, but that's okay. I'll tell him. He'll really enjoy listening to music all day. Now, where's my name? Henry. Here it is. I'm going to the beauty shop, and I said I preferred Thursday afternoons. Oh, good. That seems okay, and my start date hasn't changed either. Joe, what day did you opt for? I'm going to Highway Hotels on Monday mornings. Yes, that's okay, and starting on Monday the twelfth of March. Oh, has that been changed? Okay, I was scheduled to start the week before. I'll just make a note of that. What about me, Henry? Have I still got the Explore Travel service on Wednesday mornings? Just a minute. Where's your name?、Mm, let's see, Nancy. Okay, here it is. Explore Travel on Wednesdays. Yes, but afternoons and starting date is Wednesday, the fourteenth of March. Has the date changed? No, not the date, just the time, which is fine. I'll get to sleep in. You lazy thing, Nancy. Chris's name is next on the list.
Gorgeous Gowns Fashions. What a name. Yes, it sounds good, doesn't it? I'm hoping he'll bring me some free samples. So, has he still got Wednesday mornings? Yes, Wednesday mornings starting on the 14th of March. OK, I'll tell him when I see him tonight that his arrangements haven't changed. Gordon, what about you? I chose that software company that makes computer games. I can't remember its name, but I asked for Tuesday afternoons. Oh, oh yes, here it is. Games to go on Wednesday mornings. There's a note here saying they have their weekly staff meetings on Tuesday afternoons, so that wouldn't be much use to you. That's why they've changed it to Wednesdays, starting on the 21st of March, so you can see their working set up. OK, I'm glad they've changed it. I don't think I'd want to sit through a meeting every week. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. Can someone remind me what time we have to get to our placement in the afternoons? It says here, mornings start at 9am and afternoon sessions at 1pm. Oh, that's a shame. I thought Professor Jones was going to change it to 9.30am and 1.30pm. Yes, he did say that he'd try to make it later, but obviously that wasn't possible. By the way, just in case, what happens if we're ill or something and can't make it? Do we phone the college or the place we're going to? I think we have to phone the company first and then the college. Didn't you get the information sheet about work experience at our last seminar? No, I missed it because I had to go to the dentist. What else did it say? Well, we have to do a total of 24 hours altogether, so if we miss one of the arranged sessions, we have to organise another time to make up the hours. And he gave us details of the presentation we have to give about our work experience. Oh really? What do we have to do? In week 10, we each have to give a presentation to the class about the company we've been with. It's 30% of a final mark for this subject. So it's going to be a lot of work. Yes, he's expecting us to do a lot of research while we're there so that we can outline the history of the company, its management structure, number of employees, other branches, etc. And he said we should use lots of visuals such as diagrams and flowcharts during the presentation. Yes, and we should also include what we did each week the different departments of the company or positions that we observed, and tried to relate what we saw to our studies so far. He gave examples like management style, accounting systems, information technology, and so on. You were right. It sounds like lots of work. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk given by Jim Allen. He is going to share some of his findings of his research. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today we'll be hailing from Jim Allen, who will be sharing some of the findings of his research project from last term. Jim. Thanks. Well, to start with, a little bit of background about the project. As you can see, our title is something that is relevant to everybody in this part of the world. Water safety. These days, there's a lot more to water safety because of the increasing number and range of boats and other things people use on public waterways. I'd become interested, through reports on radio, about the number of incidents involving small powerboats and individual watercraft, such as jet skis. It seemed to me that because these craft were essentially recreational and didn't require licenses to use, there was very little opportunity to influence the users towards being safety conscious. So, I decided to make this the focus of the project. For the research, we mainly relied upon talking to people, asking them questions in preference to using a written questionnaire. We interviewed a wide range of people at a number of popular swimming locations over two consecutive weekends and asked them what they'd observed or experienced themselves. The respondents were both male and female, but the men were just slightly in the majority. We were pleased with their willingness to talk about the subject and all told interviewed 145 people over the two weekends. So, what were the findings? As you can see, 86% of people reported having had some type of problem. A surprisingly large percentage, 27%, commented that they had found it necessary to shout at an offending powerboat. But the main type of problem was the deafening sound that some of the boats made. On occasions, this led to swimmers deciding to move to another location. So what strategies did people adopt to ensure their own comfort and safety? Let's have a look at the figures. First, it was noticeable that there were often distinctly different answers between men and women. It was mainly the women, for example, who said they should try to choose places where boats couldn't go, whereas it was usually the men who said you shouldn't have to move if you were there first, so you should shout at them if necessary. Both men and... Oh, sorry, no, it was women who said you should call the authorities if the situation gets too dangerous or the powerboat drivers are acting irresponsibly. Then, I had thought it would be mainly women, but both sexes made the point that above all, it's important to get children away from any possible danger. Men were very aware that jet skis could be unpredictable in inexperienced hands. They also made the point that it's much safer to have your car nearby and clearly visible to any watercraft if you're swimming in a relatively remote spot. Finally, wearing visible clothing, men didn't think it was quite as important as women, but both gave it a high safety rating. When we asked them what they thought the government should do to help solve the problem, That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.